I want to start today by talking briefly about the ways in which our bodies impact our minds. Okay, so bear with me as I read some facts about that. During a panic attack, your body experiences surges in adrenaline, cortisol, and immune system activity. That's a combustible mix for the heart. If it happens too often, like if you have a panic attack multiple times a day, it can cause the heart to beat erratically, increasing heart attack risk. One study has shown that people with panic disorder face a 47% higher risk for heart disease. Your risk for a heart attack also leaps 30% if you are depressed. Depression can trigger a nonstop onslaught of cortisol and adrenaline. It can also make your platelets, that is, in your uh, blood vessels, stickier and more prone to forming clots that can stop blood flow to the heart. Not only does one, show, one study show that depressed people have nearly the double, double the risk of developing a painful skin condition called psoriasis, but the mental health ailment of depression can also increase the risk for psoriatic arthritis in people who already have the skin disorder. Both depressive episodes and psoriasis are associated with high levels of cytokines, which are proteins pumped out by the immune system leading researchers to believe that there's a common inflammatory thread. Okay, a, few, a couple more of these. Migraines are linked to anxiety and depression. People plagued by migraines are two and a half times more likely to report anxiety than people who are not plagued by migraines. The prime suspect is an overactive sympathetic nervous system. A constant adrenaline-induced arousal may trigger anxious or depressed feelings, and then as the hormone rush tapers, levels of pain-blocking steroids drop off, opening the door to crushing migraines. Nearly a third of people with the mental health condition called bipolar disorder suffer migraines, versus just a tenth of the general population. The connection is so strong that the same medication is regularly used to treat both conditions. There are a couple of others. Irritable bowel syndrome is connected to anxiety and depression. Anxiety and depression more than triple the risk for irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, possibly because folks with mood disorders are more sensitive to GI discomfort than the average person. Okay, mood disorders can also worsen IBS symptoms since the colon is partially controlled by the nervous system. There's also a link between allergies and depression. Studies have found severe allergy sufferers are 72% more likely to feel depressed than healthy individuals. And actually that suicide attempts increase when pollen counts rise. There's a connection between diabetes and schizophrenia. People with schizophrenia face a doubled risk for diabetes. There may be a genetic link. Family members of people with the mental health disorder, schizophrenia, also tend to have high blood sugar. Often, uh, though, uh, cortisol levels that are elevated are a cause for weight gain, so they may also be a factor. Similarly, antipsychotics used to treat schizophrenia can cause weight gain. Okay, those are negative connections between mind and body. There are also positive connections as well. Studies show our coping mechanisms and ways we handle stress directly correlate to how we deal with serious illnesses, including cancer. Chronic stress affects the body in a negative way. And over long periods of time, long-term stress can make us more susceptible to diabetes, hypertension, heart diseases, and some infections. However, by using our mind-body connection in a positive way, by keeping our bodies and minds in shape with exercise and nutrition, we can keep stress levels lower. The better we are able to cope by staying calm and reducing psychological stress, the more that we seem to reduce physical stress. Again, numerous studies have shown this along with the chance of developing particular diseases. 
These are extraordinary realities. They are extraordinary because they suggest that the mind can in dramatic ways impact the body. In other words, the mind in some sense can do things that have physical importance at the highest possible levels. We have looked at the mind-body problem several times in this course. Okay, there's a major theme in Descartes' meditations. Descartes is a, an advocate of what might be called substance dualism. Substance dualism is just the view that humans are made up of two things, both of which are different substances. And by different substances, I mean that they are different in kind. They exhibit different properties, have different characteristics, and uh, different, different laws govern them. Substance dualism is a very robust theory. It helpfully explains certain very difficult to explain phenomena. For example, the existence of first personal conscious experiences that cannot be had, at least as far as we know, by inanimate objects, like the tables and chairs we are sitting at. And yet substance dualism struggles to explain the facts that I just recited, the ways in which bodies and minds seem to interact the ways in which minds seem to have a powerful impact on bodily ailments, bodily diseases. And the ways in which bodies, in a vice versa way, also impact minds. If the mind is formed by a distinct type of substance not governed by the laws of physics, then the question is, what is the empirically identifiable meeting point where mind and body connect and hook up, as it were? Where is it? Where is that meeting point located? Okay, the absence of an empirically identifiable meeting point between a non-physical mind and its physical extension, the body, has proven deeply problematic for substance dualism. Okay, and for this reason, there are actually some philosophers, as I've mentioned in this class, who are physicalists and who think that the mind is not something that is separate from the body because of problems like this. And yet almost everyone, as they go about their daily life, non-reflectively, has the overwhelming sense that their mind is something that can't just be reduced to physical explanations. Okay, Descartes actually has a, an argument in Meditation 6 for the distinctness of his mind from his body. He writes in Meditation 6, I'm going to be reading here, so I'll, I'll go slowly, it's a complex paragraph. First, I know that if I have a vivid and clear thought of something, God could have created it in a way that exactly corresponds to my thought. So the fact that I can vividly and clearly think of one thing apart from another assures me that the two things are distinct from one another, that is, that they are two. So my mind, which can be clearly and distinctly perceived, is a distinct thing from my body. Furthermore, my mind is me. It is the essence of my personal identity. I know that I exist and that nothing else belongs to my nature or essence except that I am a thinking thing. From this it follows that my essence consists solely in my being a thinking thing, even though there may be a body that is very closely joined to me. I have a vivid and clear idea of myself as something that thinks and isn't extended, and a clear idea of body as something extended that does not think. So it is certain that I am really distinct from my body and can exist without it. 
Okay, there's a very famous argument in that paragraph in Meditation 6. And the idea is that the mind is one thing, the body is another. And Descartes seems to be asserting that his personal identity, the I that makes him who he is, is his mind, his feeling of self-consciousness, his experiences, his accumulation of mental phenomena, and not necessarily his body, which he sees as merely a secondary extension of his mind. And certainly, cognitively, it is experienced secondarily to, that, uh, to the experiences that he has of his mind as such. Okay, um... I wanted to ask you guys one more time. I've asked you guys this before in class, but I want to ask you guys one more time now that we have explored this topic at greater length because you've got a little bit more of a, of a background to adjudicate the topic. Is dualism what human beings are? It's what the majority of us thought the first time around when I asked this question. Is dualism what human beings are? In other words, are human beings two things simultaneously, minds and bodies? Okay, Prosper says yes. Okay, others? Is dualism what we are? The great problem, yes? Okay, the great problem is the empirically identifiable connection point between this non-physical thing that I experience sensationally in my mind and the physical reality that is my body. How can that be something that is empirically verifiable, that connection point? Okay, you guys will get a kick out of this. Descartes actually posited the existence of a gland that did this. Okay, this is primitive science from the 16th century. He, which gland? I thought it was a gland um, at the base of the skull near the cerebellum. And he thought that that gland served as the connection point between the physical body and the cognitive experience. And it was a sort of a magical organ that transformed physical sensations into cognitive experiences and vice versa. Um, yeah... Pretty much everybody since Descartes has said, nah, dude. But this is a this is an incredibly difficult nut to crack. Here's, here's part of why it's incredibly difficult. Okay? Think about the theory of natural selection, which is the dominant theory that uh, is present in biology to explain uh, common descent. Right? Okay, and natural selection stipulates that the reason why certain creatures, species, continue and others do not is because some are more fit. And by fit is meant they are able to propagate themselves more successfully than other species. And what is selected by natural selection is certain characteristics, physical organs, Things that have coping power in this world, the ability to live, the ability to make their um, holders live long enough to propagate and uh, continue the species. Okay, natural selection posits that the reason why all of the things that we have as human beings are what they are, the, the, um, the bipedal modality, right? The reason why we have the ability to smell the ability to hear, the ability to see, is because these have been selected. These have been selected. And yet there is a giant gaping hole in that theory of natural selection, and it is when it comes to explaining the origins of consciousness and resolving what seems to be the case, which is at least what the great majority of humans believe to be the case, which is that we are two things, bodies and minds simultaneously. Because natural selection has to say that what happened was creatures and species were selected for the existence of conscious properties 
out of non-conscious things. Okay, in other words, natural selection says there were non-conscious things and then conscious things were selected. And if consciousness is something that is wholly different from the physical, how does it get selected? Like, where does it come from? There are different theories that get thrown about here. People say, different scientists say things like, well, um, uh, the confluence of certain organs, which in initially were intended for other things, happens to come together to create the experience of consciousness. So it supervened on these organs, uh, even though they were intended for other things. Okay, I find this grossly implausible. Uh, I don't think that the odds of organs that were actually intended uh, by evolutionary processes for other things could come together to make a conscious experience by happenstance. Okay, I actually do believe that consciousness is inserted in the evolutionary process at a certain point because I'm a theistic evolutionist and I think that God guided the process and God actually at certain points along the line, did extra physical things to make the process happen more successfully, like inserting consciousness into certain creatures. Because I don't think we have a very good explanation. In fact, I don't think we have an explanation at all for how you can get a non-physical substance like consciousness out of physical stuff. How can physical stuff be selected in the pattern of common descent to create non-physical substance? It's just not something that I think we have any, like we aren't even close to an adequate explanation, nor do I think we're, uh, we're going to get an adequate explanation because I don't think you can explain non-physical experiences like consciousness by referencing physical processes alone. Okay, so... Um, so this is like a really big problem that Descartes got his finger on and that still lies at the heart of human inquiries. Prosper says she's a dualist. Okay, Gabby says she's a dualist. I'm a dualist too. But what does this mean? This seems to mean that if we hold to this view, we're committed to the notion that, um, that there's a part of us that can't be reducible or explainable just in terms of the physical and therefore that can't be traceable just to a process of physical common descent without reference to some external force. Now, some philosophers try to solve this problem by disagreeing with Descartes and his substance dualism. And as I've mentioned before, they are physicalists and they say there is nothing in the universe that is not physical. But I find this wholly implausible as well. It's wholly implausible because I have thoughts each day that I think cannot be reducible just to physical phenomena. They are more than just neur uh, neural pathways firing because I experience the sensation of thinking that the neural pathways firing just quite simply cannot explain. Because it's kind of a mystery here, right? It's really a mystery that's still at the heart. Like it was at the heart of the enterprise of science and, and the enterprise of philosophy back in Descartes' day, and it's still there. Like it hasn't gone away, and it's probably not going to go away for a long, long time, if ever. Any comments or thoughts on this? All of you who are substance dualists out there, do you think the facts that I read about minds appearing through, you know, these studies about connections between things like diabetes and schizophrenia or allergies and depression or irritable bowel syndrome and anxiety or bipolar disorder and migraines, do you think that these facts are true? I think they are. I think these studies are getting at something that's real. I think that there's overwhelming statistical evidence that minds impact bodies. But I have no idea how it happens. That's crazy talk when you get to like a discussion of exactly the way, the mechanism in which it, by means of which it occurs. Uh, 
that's, yeah. That's yeah, so the way that that is best explained is this. Um, the great majority of our uh, thought processes are actually happening behind or beneath uh, the experience of consciousness at any particular moment. Uh, so if you think about it just in terms of habits, you and I have both formed habits that govern our days. Okay, and I stumbled into the kitchen this morning and I poured myself a bowl of cereal without actually even thinking about it. Because that's a subconscious habit that I have formed. And the part of my brain that governs that is what was operating at that time. I think I was thinking about, um, so my wife is seven months preggers, right? And so I think I was thinking about, did she have a bad night last night or not? While pulling, pouring this bowl of cereal. And a, a majority of my brain was involved in the physical processes of standing and balancing and pouring the milk out into the cereal bowl and all that, while a minority of my brain was involved in the process of thinking about whether my wife slept or not last night. Um, but in all such cases, uh, the brain does seem to have an impact on body. So mind does seem to be impacting body, whether or not a lot of mind is being used or a little bit of mind is being used. Yeah. It would probably overwhelm our systems. My understanding from what the, um, the cognitive psychologists tell us is that part of the reason why the brain only accesses or only uses, you know, 7% or whatever the statistic is in conscious thought at any given time is because it actually would be overwhelming to us to do anything otherwise. In order to be able to function, the brain apparently has to constantly actually uh, trim and prune those neural pathways that are not being actively used. That's why losing memory over time is a good thing. It's a good thing. Because if you had in your mind accessible right now all the memories of all your past, you would be unable to function mentally. <laughs> it would be overwhelming. Um, and so the brain trimming neural pathways that are no longer being used uh, is actually a coping mechanism that is of great value to us and that enables us to devote our cognitive attention to other things than uh, just just thinking about the experiential history that the, the, the mind happens to have. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it is something that the brain, I think, has developed over millennia as a coping mechanism in order to function as a as an organ of thought. Yeah, um, it's not something that you and I consciously decide. We cannot help it. Our uh, brains do it whether we like it or not. There are cases. Uh, I was reading one time about this one patient who was labeled patient S by this doctor who studied him for years. It was a Russian patient, a Russian doctor, and it's a very famous memory case. Apparently this guy could remember everything, like everything. It's the sort of thing that is, um, is uh, featured in the movie Goodwill Hunting, right? And this guy could remember the face of his nanny in the crib and all of it in between. And he tried to burn his memories because like it, it plagued him. Like his mind was just overwhelmed with these memories all the time. He couldn't get them out of his head. He tried to like write them down on a sheet of paper and like burn the sheet of paper to try to forget things, but he couldn't do it. This is a fascinating case. I guess his mind was functioning, um, was, uh, functioning mistakenly, incorrectly. I think it must not have been uh, a, a flourishing uh, cognitive experience uh, that he was going through. But uh, that's very rare. Uh, the, the, the properly functioning brain uh, constantly, imagine um, 
I, I don't know, just visually speaking, imagine uh, someone who's walking along a pathway, okay, and he like constantly chops off the pathway behind him, and so it falls away. So all that he really sees is, you know, just like the last five or six feet of the path while the rest of it is constantly being chopped off so that he can keep going forward. That's the way the brain works. And that's actually a good thing that it does that. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> okay, so think about this, those of you who are substance dualists, as I am, I'm a substance dualist, but think about these problems because there are some serious problems. How does the mind connect to the body? We don't know. Mystery. Um, as a theist, I have abundant resources for explaining this. I think God's doing something to connect human minds to bodies. But that's a really, like, that's dicey territory to say there's, you know, mystery here. We'll just describe it to God because, you know, I guess I'm sufficiently rationalist in my thought processes that and I also think that God made the world in such a way that he intended for us to discover how it works. It's not that he wanted it to be a mystery. So I think that he, he set it up so that we could continually find out through the proper application of study and, and insight and reflection and, uh, and induction, we could properly ascertain what its inner workings are. Uh, the problem is we are so far from ascertaining what the inner workings are of the mind-body connection as to make it seem as though this was always intended to be a mystery. Like we are not even close. Nobody's even close to figuring out how um, minds can give a command and bodies can respond uh, in ways that are actually uh, meaningful. Okay, um, there's one other wrap-up issue I want to do with Descartes today from the sixth meditation, and then I'm going to uh, say some brief uh, introductory things about Pascal, and then I'm going to let you guys go a little bit early. Uh, the wrap-up thing is this. Um, realism versus anti-realism in science. Realism versus anti-realism in science. Did you know that there have been a lot of scientific theories over the centuries that turned out to be false? Not, like, not just mildly false, but dramatically false. Perhaps the most famous of these is the, uh, the geocentric theory of the universe. The idea that the Earth is at the center of it all. But here's some others as well. Um, the four humors theory of human physiology. For centuries, humans believed that the body's internal um, chemicals were made up of four humors, H-U-M-O-U-R-S. And if these got out of proportion, uh, then disease happened. Okay, and that was the source of their, exp that was their explanation for diseases, was that the, the, the humors were out of order, out of proportion. Um, spontaneous generation was a scientific theory for many centuries. The idea was that it's possible for matter to come from nothing. Aristotle, for instance, referenced spontaneous generation when he asserted that uh, the reason why maggots appear on rotting meat is because the meat spontaneously generates uh, the maggots. Okay? It's an adequate explanation if you lack microscopes, I suppose. Um, here are some, a few others. Uh, phlogiston theory. Okay, this is the view that, this was a view that was widespread for centuries. This is the view that uh, actually what is happening in fire, when fire takes place, is an element of combustion is being released. It is an actual element that is being released, as opposed to being a, um, a chemical reaction that is taking place. Uh, or how about this one, phrenology? Okay, phrenology was the view that uh, you could actually inspect people's brains um, through the lumps on their skull, and you could ascertain on this basis what their personalities were. You could ascertain on this basis what their um, key, uh, 
key knowledge strengths and weaknesses were, and you could make medical prescriptions about things that they needed to do to, to heal or improve their minds by feeling the bumps and, and bits and crevices and valleys in their heads. This is a prominent theory as recently as the 19th century. Or how about this one, the floating uterus theory. Okay, this is coming from male scientists, I'm sure. But the theory was that the reason why women seemed to have so many emotional problems was because their uterus floats around in their body. It's a, 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 an organ unhinged from the other organs. And in floating around in their body, it causes, it runs up against other organs and it causes distress or anxiety or various forms of depression. Okay, it turns out women have emotional difficulties because they experience, surprise, regular cycles. Okay? And the floating uterus theory didn't actually work. <laughs> okay. Um, others, uh, Vulcan the planet was used to explain uh, the perturbations in Mercury's orbits. Turns out Einstein's theory of general relativity does a much better job of explaining those perturbations than positing the existence of another planet. Um, here's another. Before the germ theory of disease, the dominant theory of disease was the miasmatic theory of disease. It was thought that miasmas in the air floated around. This is actually what Florence Nightingale, the famous nurse, worked with as her basic theory of disease. Uh, she had to clean out the miasmas in the air, was the thought, before they influenced people. Okay, now, quite clearly, the history of science is littered with numerous theories that have now been debunked as being wholly false. Okay? And probably, there are theories that we currently hold. In fact, almost certainly there are theories that we currently hold about the nature of the world around us that are going to be identified, properly identified, by future generations as being false. Okay, I think that's pretty clear from looking at past generations and our own awareness of their mistakes. Isn't it? Okay, on the basis of this, uh, what has arisen in the um, aftermath of Descartes and his inspections of uh, the mind and its ability to know nature and uh, his skepticism about our ability to know the uh, operations and uh, organization of the natural world. On the basis of this, what has arisen is uh, two main camps in the philosophy of science, the realists and the anti-realists. The realists and the anti-realists are both trying to answer the same question. And that question is, what is it that science is getting at? What is it that science is getting at? But they come up with different answers. The realists say what science is getting at is truth. What scientists are aiming at is truth. When scientists try to explain the world, the universe, the operations of our bodies, the organization of nature, what they are trying to do is they are trying to explain something that is the case. They are trying to posit theories that correspond to a reality that actually exists and that is a certain way. That's the realist view. Okay, the anti-realist view say, no, actually, that's not what science is doing at all. Science is not trying to get at truth. Okay, and the anti-realists can be divided into two camps. The useful camp and the pleasing camp. And again, all of this comes out of Descartes' uh, skepticism about our ability to know the natural world and, and what that means, okay? The useful camp and the pleasing camp. The useful camp says, well, actually what science is getting at is knowledge that is useful to us. And for the anti-realists who are in the useful camp, they say, look, it doesn't really matter whether science gets at truth or not. That's actually beside the point. We don't really care if science is getting at truth about the world. What matters is, is this knowledge useful? Can it, can it create technologies? Technologies that are of value and can be employed by human beings to advance human prosperity or increase human flourishing. So these people actually uh, 
find the realist explanation for what science is getting at to be wholly unintelligible. They think that it doesn't, like, it's not really something that's intelligible to say when you say science is getting at truth or science is not getting at truth. Rather, science isn't even in the truth game at all for the anti-realists who say that science is aiming at that which is useful. Okay, there's another camp, the pleasing camp. These people say, um, they agree that science is not getting at truth, but they say that science is not necessarily getting what is useful either. Rather, science is getting at what is pleasing. Okay, and I guess I could say, alongside pleasing, I could say political. Pleasing slash political camp. These people say, well, actually, what science is getting at is whatever is going to make humans feel good or achieve a consensus, achieve a majority, achieve political power. Okay, the old joke in uh, the sciences is that scientific theories are not proven false. Rather, they are discarded when their primary authorities die out. Okay, and maybe there's something to that, but there are anti-realists who fall into the pleasing or political camp say, um, it's not truth that science is getting at, and it's not really that which is valuable to humans that science is getting at. Rather, what science is getting at is whatever can, um, can achieve a dominant position as an explanation for a particular phenomenon among human beings. Okay, and basically all these groups hate each other. <laughs> the people who say science is getting at truth are appalled. They're Honestly, they're shocked by the idea that uh, science is a political enterprise where power games are played and where some who are ascendants can dominate others, or even by the idea that science should serve technology and that science should only be uh, aimed at that which uh, will ultimately be valuable to humans. And these people, like the people in the political camp, they're shocked by the idea that uh, science aims at truth, and they point to numerous instances in history of scientific theories that were ascendant primarily because of political reasons. Right? And they, they point to things in our own day that suggest that scientific theories become ascendant because of political reasons. Okay, and if you look at um, some of the statistics, it quickly becomes evident that a large number of theories get proposed and pushed forward because of the grant money involved. Okay, or they get proposed and they get pushed forward and favored uh, because they will enable... They are publishable results that enable people to advance their professional futures. Okay, right? The, uh, again, another old joke in uh, the scientific enterprise is that uh, you don't get published if you prove that variables X, Y, and Z have no correlation among each other. Rather, you get published by positing a correlation among variables X, Y, and Z. And people want to get published because they want to advance their professional careers and so they posit the existence of such variables even when the statistics are tenuous. Okay, so the different camps all hate each other and they all point to their various particular um, points of evidence as, uh, as you know, a basis for saying that what they are doing is primarily a, a description of the core of the scientific enterprise. Okay, and all of that comes out of Descartes and his skepticism about our ability to know. Um, any comments or thoughts on that about what it is that science is aiming at? The temptation for me, I'll speak personally while you guys are thinking about your comments, uh, the temptation for me is to say there's a mix of all of these that's probably involved. Yeah, it's we're getting at truth, but we do it by political means, or we do it because certain technologies can be appropriated. Um, I was reading this fascinating article that said that and, and it was really convincing. I was, I was totally convinced coming away from this article. It said that the reason why certain scientific and technological inventions take off in the second half of the 20th century is because the science fiction writers immediately following World War II envision a future with these kinds of technologies. 
And like I was, I was for it. I, initially, I was skeptical. I was like, no way. And then like the guy made the case, and like by the end of it, I was pretty much on board. I was like, yeah, that's really convincing, actually. That like the science fiction writers cast a vision, and then the actual technologists brought it about by means of pursuing certain kinds of technologies in the subsequent decades. Okay, but uh, any comments or thoughts on this, at, what, on the uh, subject of what science is getting at? Right, without government to say, you guys will all focus on this field or on that field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. We'll pay, we'll pay, we will pay higher wages, better grants to people who, you know, study EVs or something like that, as opposed to people who find ways to make ICEs, internal combustion engines, more efficient or something like that. Yeah, I think there's, there's truth there. Anybody else on this, this topic? <laughs> they already have the money, so they can do it. You guys know what he named his kid, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like weird. It's like, it's, what is it, like A, A, E or something? Like X, I, I? And that's the kid's like real name? It's something weird like that, yeah. It's like he's, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Anyway, it's really weird. Um. I think he's also actually a fraud in a lot of ways. Like the way he, he you know, throws up like we're going to have robo taxis tomorrow or we're going to have we're all going to be going to Mars within five years. I think it's kind of a Barnum and Bailey circus show <laughs> sci fi author on his own. Yeah. OK, a um, couple of introductory comments about uh, Pascal. OK, and then I'll let you guys go because um, it's a holiday and uh, we'll, we'll be doing Pascal next week. Um, Pascal is also a Frenchman. Uh, he is also Catholic, but he approaches the topic of philosophy in a very different way than Descartes. Okay, if you'll recall from having read the meditations now, Descartes has this very meticulous, cautious, careful, sifting approach to reason. He is uh, constantly inspecting his own thought processes and wondering whether what he is thinking is indeed rationally defensible. Okay, Pascal is deeply unimpressed by this. Pascal, in fact, thinks that reason is largely bankrupt as a way of ascertaining truth about our world. Because reason fools philosophers into thinking that they know what is going on. When, in fact, so often, all that they are doing is building castles in the air. And their theories do not, in fact, correspond to the way the world is. OK, so if your experience in this course has been, you know, as we go through a succession of thinkers, well, this guy thought that. And, you know, that's kind of convincing. But this guy thought the opposite. And that's convincing, too. You know, and, and like as you go along, you think to yourself, well, you know, he can't be right because he says the exact or the opposite. And this third guy says something different altogether. Right. Pascal is your guy, if that's your experience. Because Pascal, uh, Pascal is famous as a fideist. He discards reason. Okay, fideism is a, a view of philosophy that is anti-rational. It says the idea that we can ascertain truth through the use of reason is wholly arrogant and overblown. Okay, it is an anti-rational approach to philosophy, and it says that. Uh, all that reason will do is it will lead to contradictions. Okay, one man using his reason says God exists on these arguments. Another man using his reason says God does not exist, using his arguments. And these contradictions or antinomies of reason, uh, as they are called, cannot be simultaneously the case. And so Pascal is the famous philosopher in the canon who throws up his hands and says, it's all wrong, the use of reason as such 
is wrong. Okay, and so he approaches philosophy from a completely different perspective. Now, um, the Pensees, unfortunately, is not a linear work. Pascal died before he completed it. Okay, it is a series of vignettes or short meditations that have not actually been put together in a comprehensive package. But that's partly maybe by design, although he did intend to finish the work. Because if you think that reason can't put things together in a comprehensive package, and you want to say something that is philosophically interesting, then what you end up doing is you end up saying observational things here and there that are pleasing, valuable, or useful, but that don't necessarily try to piece it all together in a systematic, coherent way that fits together with nice little interchangeable parts and all that like Descartes is trying to do. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind as we read Pascal. And I'll say a few more actual personal biographical details about him uh, when we get started next week. Okay, that's all I've got on that.